First of all, when you have known difference, it's the test that is now preferred, or the test that we now use is the paired test, where there's a known difference. We do not use the paired test when the difference is has an unknown perimeter about it. Uh, and you have to be very careful of whether it is a known perimeter or not. For example, we would not normally uh, use uh, the paired test to ask a question, which has the more peach smell? Because different people have different ideas of what a peach smell is. And one person may be using one characteristic of the peach smell, and another one may be using another characteristic of the peach smell. And so since that is not an easily definable odor, uh, the peach smell, uh, the pair test is not an appropriate test because different people can be, will be judging the peach smell on different characteristics. It's not unequivocal. It's not clear exactly what you have them. And you only use the paired test when it's quite clear, where the difference is known to everybody or equally known to everybody. Now, what makes sensory examination a little exciting and so forth, having answered that question, if you had an expert panel who'd been working on peaches for 25 years, as we have a man over here in pomology that's been working on peaches for 45 years, and uh, he, if he had a, a group of people like that, you could use a paired test for that, because they all know what the peach smell is. But with normal laboratory panels, not highly trained, be sure that they all understand the test. That's the question you have to ask yourself. Will they be able to answer this clearly in their mind the same as everybody else? And if they can't do that, then you have to devise another kind of test. And the kind of test that you devise for that is either the duo trio or the triangular test. Because there, it is not, we do not care what the perimeters of the difference are. Uh, it's only, is there a difference between them? Any kind of a difference. And, of course, we, we make sure that that difference is what we're interested in. And sometimes that's a little hard. We now normally use the triangular taste test or test for determining judges' ability. We find this to be a useful sort of screening test for that. Uh, but, as you'll recall what I said last time, the triangular taste test is not appropriate for asking for preference or for directional difference because it involves too many decisions. And they get confused. The judges get confused. But if it's a simple difference and you want to get the judge's ability for an equal number of tests, that's fine. To, 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 to test the judges. In general, if discrimination is the objective, and I said this last time, but I'll repeat it now, if discrimination is the objective, that is, if you want to discriminate between two samples, don't permit ties. That not only confuses the mathematics, but confuses the judges. But if you're asking for preference, which one of the two do they prefer, and they don't have to prefer either one, they're all free and independent on taste, at least. Why, then you can allow them to have ties. And you get additional information. The additional information that you get is that a certain number of people don't like either sample. They, they just don't have any preference for them at all. And that's useful information. It's useful information. Now, a modification of a rating scale, which has recently come into use, and is similar to scorecards, only it's given a different way. It's called magnitude estimation. And the essential difference between this and an ordinary rating scale is that in an ordinary rating scale, like we were talking about last time, a scorecard, a structured or unstructured scorecard, and so forth, the experimenter makes up the scorecard. The experimenter makes up the scorecard. In magnitude estimation, the observer makes up the scorecard. The observer makes up the scorecard. What you do is get the subject very familiar with the range of stimuli. He can 
you can taste them, low amounts and high amounts. Suppose we're working on saltiness of, of tomato soups. Well, he works on tomato soups at various levels of, of saltiness and so forth. And then you, after he's become very familiar with them and so forth, you um, tell him that you want him to rank these samples or arrange these samples on a scale of his own making. He makes up the scale. However, the scale will be arranged so that if he scores at one, and 10 will be two times as much, and 100 will be two times as much as that, or 10 times as much as the original one down here. In other words, a sort of logarithmic scale, or geometric scale, I should say. So that 10 is two times as strong, and so forth. Uh, he must understand that it's a ratio scale that we're developing here. That we're not, each one of these represents one step. The next one would be 1,000, and so forth. The next one would be 10,000. That this kind of magnitude, there are other kinds of expressing the magnitude. I've only given you a very simple one here. And that since it's believed by Stevens that magnitudes go up as the power function, as a power function, he th believes that people should construct scales on the basis of a geometrical thing and that they should do this themselves. So the scale in this case is made up by the person. He fixes the points on the scale. This is barely salty. This is two times as salty. This is uh, two times as salty as that. One more step up here and so forth. Um, by the square, you see. Well, at any rate, uh, this has been used very little. It would require a good deal of sophistication of the judges uh, to make this work. It's primarily concerned with determining the relationship between the stimulus and the perceived intensity. That's what it's primarily concerned with. And the samples can be presented singly and the mathematics is not too difficult. Now, another little thing I picked up that I didn't tell you about. You probably know this, but sometimes people don't. In making up a chi-square, you all know what that minus one is for. The correction for contingency when you're working with small samples, because the steps when you have a small number of samples and a small number of people involved here too, uh, interfere with each other. There's a certain fuzziness in which step you put it in. And so you sometimes get too great a significance. And by taking away the one here, you correct for that fuzziness or that uh, skewiness that develops in low numbers, uh, low numbers of people. So you will mostly be making that correction for contingency. Another question that I didn't make quite clear last time. When is positional bias most obvious? When do you get positional bias the most and the most difficult type of thing to avoid? This is the effect of the first sample on the second sample and so forth. Well, the correct answer to that is in the text someplace, but not in its right place, and that's the reason I'm emphasizing. You get positional bias when adaptation is very rapid, where the second sample does not show up as sharply as the first sample did. Suppose that you're using edible oils. The first sample you can tolerate, and so forth, but you are adapted physiologically and psychologically to the edible oil by the time you get to the second sample. So positional bias is much worse with some things than with other things. That's the real point I wanted to get at there. But wherever adaptation is very rapid, you're bound to have this positional effect. Now, the, when do you use, um, in, the, in the triangular taste test and in the duo trio taste test, what do you, how do you choose which should be the different sample? Uh, well, if you don't know what the difference between them is, 
Either one of them could be the different sample, and you do it at random. You make the standard one sample, and you make the standard the other sample. And the other one obviously becomes the, the different sample at that stage. So if you don't know what the possible difference is, you simply alternate the standard, the samples. In the triangular taste test, one of them will be the, the two samples, and the other one will be different. And then the different one will be the two samples, and the other one will be uh, different, and all kinds of combinations of that type. Or in the duo trio, one sample is the standard one time, the other sample is the standard the other time. That's when you have no way of telling them apart, you don't know anything about them, they're just giving you two samples and you're running a duo trio or a triangular. Now, there are two other cases, however, that are important. First, it's best to use the familiar sample, the one that they are, are most familiar with. The judges are more likely to make a correct judgment when the control represents a familiar flavor. That is, the control will be the standard, or the, uh, in the other case, it will be the odd sample in the, in the triangular taste test. If that's something familiar, something they know, and it's constantly made the standard, or it's constantly made the odd sample, you'll get better differentiation. You may not always want it to get better differentiation, but if you need to get finer judgments, that's one way of doing it. It's used in maintaining standard blends, this sort of thing is. Also in the triangular taste test, if the odd sample is made stronger, if it's the one that's got the stronger character as against the other one, which in a way is the familiar type of thing, they are more likely to get it picked out as the odd sample. The weaker sample in this case would be the paired samples. Also, a variation of that, if you have set one sample that's pleasant and one that's not pleasant, if you put the unpleasant sample as the odd sample, the different sample, you're more likely to get correct uh, judgments. So there are ways of giving the test that can improve the odds. And some of you will say to yourself, well, that's no advantage. The test itself builds in some of the answers. And it's quite true, the test does build in some of the answers, depending on which one you make the, the odd sample and which one you don't make the odd sample. In some cases that's justified, in some cases it's not. All right, now we're ready to start on today's outline. The question of... Well, I have a few things left. I still have Mr. Perez's paper and Miss Christine... Mihara's paper are both here if they want to pick them up afterward. Oh yes, I've got a couple more things that I want to talk about too. Uh, these are variations of rating scales that I didn't get a chance to put on the board last time. Here's a unstructured uh, rating scale for a variety of constituents, sweetness, acidity, carbonation, and the unstructuring simply has unsweetened at one side and highly sweetened at the other side. So suppose that somebody puts the mark right there. It's that close to highly sweetened and that far away from unsweetened. We'll say that this total distance is 10 inches. And then we measure that difference right there. And we'll say it comes out 7 inches. So the score on this one for sweetness would be 7. That's what you would record, would be seven. And that is a score now, and can be used statistically just like any other score. Or in the acidity, they might make the mark up here, and it would be nine. So the acidity score would be nine. And the carbonation, they have look on the scale and decide it's not carbonated at all, so it would be one carbon carbonation is one. Now in this same figure 58, there are some things that I don't like quite as much, and it's not commented on the test. It also asks you with similar scales to judge flavor strength, aftertaste, roundness, and impact. This, these terms are not easy to define, particularly the one impact. That's I don't really know myself what impact means. I think it 
means uh, how well do I recognize it, what is the total force or character of this particular sample. Roundness might be referring to tannin, astringency, but it also might be referring to texture, to oiliness, and so forth, the roundness of the sample. Or it might be in alcoholic beverages as to the amount of alcohol content is referring to the round. So it's not a very specific term. Aftertaste, with experience, I think most people understand it, but it's very hard to quantitize aftertaste. You try, in the, when you get the flavor description laboratory and the lecture, which will be a week from Thursday, on the flavor description uh, procedure, you'll understand that there is such a thing as aftertaste. But when you actually do this experiment, you'll find it very difficult to quantitate what you mean, how much aftertaste there is. Is there any aftertaste? Well, come to think about it, there is. But by that time, you've lost it. It's not there anymore. It doesn't linger forever, and so forth. And flavor strength, that may have a meaning or not. But some people will take flavor strength to be odors. Other people will take flavor strength to be taste. So these are not such good things to use. They can be used if you have experts, but they're not so good. Figure 59 is a structured scale with descriptive words on it. And the words I didn't, this is for diacetyl. It's in butter, judging of butter. And it says very pronounced, moderately pronounced, slightly pronounced, perceptible, moderately perceptible, slightly perceptible, and imperceptible. I'm not sure that the difference between perceptible and pronounced is very clear. And therefore, the, this, this scale here may not be linear. Uh, the difference between imperceptible and slightly perceptible, I think that's all right. Slightly to moderately, that's all right. But what is perceptible different than moderately perceptible? Will they perceive of that as a difference or not? Now, after they use it, yes, but take some use of it. This same one for butter has some other less good scales on it. One of them for flavor, which has the same objections as this unstructured scale here. Another for intensity. Intensity of what? Intensity of odor, intensity of taste, intensity of texture. Freshness. Well, I think I know what freshness in butter is. It's when it's non-rancid. But why don't they make a rancid scale out here? Maybe that's what they intended to do, is this freshness to be rancidity. And the overall flavor. That has the same problems as the aftertaste things. The overall flavor is a transitory thing, and some people will retain it, and other people will lose it very quickly. So that's the, my objection to that. One other scorecard up here, which has some very desirable things. This one is a 12-point scale, and the, without the numbers actually being on it, but it's structured by these words here, and you can just turn these into scores, 12 scores, and you have scores on them. Here is where the scores have actually been given, and the structuring is just general. This is a scorecard for something, I don't know, remember what. And 10 and 9 are desired, defined as being very desirable colors. 8, 7, and 6 as moderately desirable colors. 5, 4, and 3 as slightly undesirable colors. And 2 and 1 as very undesirable colors. This is a structured scale with scores in it, and different categories of this particular product are, each one of them have their own scale. And the scale is anchored somewhat by these descriptive terms that are being used here. Now, a variation, another variation of the, of the rating scale is what is now called quality attribute scale. You won't find this or the magnitude scale indicated in the book. You first of all develop a list of attributes. This is a sort of a, of a variation of the descriptive thing that Mrs. Pangborn will be talking about a week from Thursday. And then you group the attributes in some sort of a logical scheme. The most logical scheme is to group the uh, visual aspects first, and then the odor aspects next, and then the, the other aspects. 
and you allow them, uh, you serve singly, and you allow them uh, unlimited supply, because they're going to have to check a large number of these attributes. This is a checking chart. So you have a list of attributes. You may have 50 attributes given here, 50 attributes. And so they have to, they, the wise ones will think of two or three at a time and check those and then go on to the next group and paste that and the next group and the next group. Uh, the unwise ones will do each one of these individually and they'll have adaptation. This type of, of chart is very subject to, or this type of test is very subject to adaptation or fatigue, because you may have 30, 40, or 50 attributes listed on this chart. Now what you measure is the percent of times that an attribute was listed. We'll say rancidity in the case of butter. You have a, a panel of 30 judges, and uh, 20 of them uh, mark rancidity, just check rancidity. So the percent of judges that are Checking rancidity is 66 and two-thirds percent. So you are comparing frequency of occurrence here as to the importance it has to the quality of that particular product. If it's never mentioned at all, another sample may never mention rancidity. Nobody may check it. So you can say this one is a rancid sample, the other one is a non-rancid sample. Various kinds of statistics can be, can be, can be applied to that. And last now, catching up with myself today. The last one, there are all kinds of ways of making rankings, and I think I did not do it very good for you last time. So we'll have samples, and this is the textbook sample so that you can refer to it in the text. These are the samples up here. And these are the judges over here. And this is the approved way of giving rankings. Approved way of giving rankings. And these are judges A, B, C, and D. Well, now, this particular judge ranks the X sample fourth, the Y sample second, this one third, this one fifth, and this one one. The B one ranks this one third, this one fourth, this one one, this one fifth, this one two. And this one is one two, four, five, three, and this one is five, three, two, four, one. Now the rank totals, and that's what you need for chart I. The rank totals are given by summing these up here as to 13, 11, 10, 19, and seven. And that's what you enter in table I. And also one other thing I didn't tell you about table I, Use only the upper figures. There are two sets of figures given in table I, a lower set and an upper set. Use the upper set range. Do not use the lower set range in that. The upper set range in table I. And this is how you enter your ranking data for the samples and for the judges and how you get the rank totals and this is the generally approved method of, of summarizing your results. Now, there are other ways of doing it, uh, multiplying by factors, multiplying by the rank, times the place number, and so forth. But this one here is generally considered to be the best one. Uh, most commonly accepted, anyway, we'll say it that way. There's some people that like to do it differently because of the statistics, but I'll not go into that chart this time. All right, now we come finally to hedonic scoring. Hedonism was a Greek philosophy that said that purpose of life is to have pleasure. Epicureanism is a form of hedonism, whereas the Stoics were an opposite sect or philosophical concept where they believed that attending to duty was the most important thing in life, that there were some things that you should do and so forth. It has a psychological basis. It's been written about in psychology in this country since 1913 or something like that. There's a very good book, if you, any of you get interested in these, for a lot of work by Baby Center, 
American psychologist who wrote a whole book on pleasantness and unpleasantness. And there's been some recent interest in, in it. It was developed uh, first um, uh, at the end of the war for testing uh, uh, appeal of foods to soldiers by the quartermaster corps and was further refined and then finally was studied a great deal. It's the one test that's been developed which almost from the very beginning was an object of a great deal of research and an attempt to set the methodology. Uh, it was used for two different kinds of things. It was used to detect small differences between two similar foods. That's, for example, between dehydrated eggs and scrambled and fresh eggs scrambled. I don't think those had a small difference in my point of view, but uh, the Army thought that they had a small difference, and they were trying to see how much difference there was. It's also used in some cases, and has been used in some cases, to detect differences in degree of liking where the time and the subjects and the conditions of the test varied a great deal. And that was used for testing rations in different parts of the country uh, for army units and so forth. They were given choice of foods and which foods did they like best out of their choice of foods. They were sometimes more experienced soldiers and less experienced soldiers. There was sometimes uh, the meals were hot, sometimes they weren't so hot, sometimes they were properly served, and sometimes they weren't properly returned, reported. One of the concepts behind it was that people, in giving a, an idea of pleasure, would report directly and reliably their feelings, their inner feelings about it. That there would be a minimum level of verbal ability needed be a minimum level of verbal. You didn't have to describe anything. In fact, the test was to be given so that you didn't think about it too much. You didn't think, now, if I write down hot dog, the sergeant will think I'm just another uh, future corporal, and I want to be a sergeant someday, and so maybe I should check beef as the thing. We're not, you're supposed to do this fast enough. Uh, so that there was no thinking, no extraneous things except the pleasure and the displeasure to you internally was to be reported. Now that's easier said than done because we're all acting out parts uh, when we're tasting foods and we're reacting to our surroundings and so forth. And it's not quite so easy as that to get that. Well, it, they re early ran into some problems. First was the uh, numerical problem, the tendency to avoid the terminal points unless they were anchored. They also ran into the problem of whether to use plus and minus numbers. It seems to us, with our math 13 background and calculus math 16 background, that there's no problem in plus and minus numbers. But you give that to somebody uh, down in the Safeway uh, store here in Davis who never heard of a minus number before, and they'll say, what kind of a scorecard is that that has plus and minus numbers? I'll illustrate this in just a minute. By Anchoring the ends, we increased the dispersion of hedonic scorecards so that they were out more. And the, the responses were more meaningful. The next problem was how to find words. And uh, this was very difficult. Finally, Jones did a study of some 59 different words. And this is in this table 53, which is just here. Uh, he had people check certain foods uh, for, and they used all of these words. Now, it was a rather complicated method of getting these words done, but they were finally all done. Best of all, had a scale value of 6.15. These are done mathematically. And the standard deviation is 248, pretty high standard deviation. So that best of all, although it gives the highest scores, does not have a clear picture in people's mind. You're going to have a high standard deviation. Like extremely, with a scale value of 416, still has a standard deviation of 162, which is by no means minimal. Excellent was much better understood. The scale value wasn't as high, 371, but the standard deviation of the result was low. Like very much, 
they could agree on that. It was 291, and they agreed even closer. Good, they have pretty good, 191 was the scale value. Like moderately, the standard deviation of that is lower. Like mildly, and the standard deviation is even lower. Like slightly, as an even lower standard deviation. And for neutral, that was the best of all. It has the lowest standard deviation. The standard deviation is only 0.18. But they're neither liked it or disliked it. All right, now at that stage, I'd better write one on it and indicate some of the advantages and disadvantages of the hedonic scorecard. The one that I'm going to give you is a 9-point scorecard, like extremely, like very much, like much, like slightly, neither like nor dislike, dislike slightly, dislike much or moderately it's sometimes given, dislike very much, and dislike extremely. Now this is called a balanced hedonic scorecard. It has four on one side of the central part and four on the other side of the central part. Now there are various ways of taking scores on these. These could be plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and this could be minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. For some statistical purposes and calculators and so forth, this is the easiest sort of thing to do. But most people nowadays do not use the plus and minuses, but will rank these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that this has a score card of 9 and this has a score of 1. This is the most likely way that you will find data for this, uh, for this hedonic score card given. Well, the nine-point scorecard, when tested rather widely under several different kinds of conditions, laboratory conditions and field conditions, was better than the seven-point scorecard. So that, in general, you're better off with a... And any scorecard less than five does not work for some reason or other. We haven't discovered why, but it, it works very poorly, the scorecards of less than five for straight hedonic scorecards. It is better to eliminate the neutral one. This neutral one doesn't do you any good, neither like nor dislike. But it doesn't make any difference whether they're balanced or imbalanced. Now, this is a balanced one. If you left this out here, it would be balanced also because it would have four better and four worse, or there's four on each side here. It's better to leave this one out but you can have a scorecard that had five on the plus side and three on the negative side. You can have one with four on the plus side and four on the negative side, which this one is right here. The, we do not get any better results with one or the other. It was thought that, the, that people might be more soft-hearted if there was more on the plus side. And that's true in, a, in personality ratings we do that. In psychological tests where you're ranking people according to their personality traits and so forth, it's better to have more on the positive side than it is on the negative. But as far as foods are concerned, people apparently do not project themselves into the food situation. So it doesn't make any difference whether it's balanced or not balanced. You can have either one. If you wanted to take one of these off here, you could have taken one off and you'd get just as good a result if you had one left, as long as they're essentially the same number. Well, what you, the instructions for these are important. What kind of instructions should you give? First of all, you have to tell them what the person needs to know, how to use the, the scorecard. You have to tell them that this is a scorecard, that the words mean exactly what they say they mean. That like extremely means to like very much, much more than very much. To like very much 
is to like more than much or moderately, and less than extremely. So some verbal or written communication has to be made to the pen. However, it's very easy to do. This can be done under mess hall conditions uh, for up to a thousand people it's been done. Uh, it can be done um, uh, individually as they go through the trial line. Or it can be done on the scorecard itself, a description of what the test is about and so forth. Also in doing this, you have to tell them to react without too much trying to overreact. Otherwise, they will try and not guess you. And they'll always have some jokers in the crowd, That's especially in the Army or the Armed Forces. There'll be somebody that says that they like extremely sauerkraut and they hate ice cream. Uh, and just to throw the sergeants off, you see, and so forth. So you have to appeal to a little loyalty and uh, patriotism and so forth in order to get the results on this. And, and by the way, this is true of almost any kind of scorecard you have. Uh, over at the State Fair, when, when we were uh, did some tests on, on low alcohol muscat wines, we did some tests on rosé wines with different amounts of sugar. There were, there were jokers who would go through just for the drink, of course, but they would also, you'd hear them talking. We, we could, they were in the booths and we were behind the booths so we could hear them talking or they were sitting at a table when they got the samples. And they say, well, I know this is sweet and uh, I'm gonna mark it that I can't tell any difference from that, just to throw them off. Uh, they were reacting to us, you see. We were uh, running the test and so forth. And so you always have to be careful of the jokers in the crowd who give you false or improper things. Now, the first thing is the contrast effect. This was believed at first to be very subject to the contrast effect. Namely, that if you had a... Uh, a good sample, first to rank, marked it like extremely. Then you had a bad sample. We say we're, we're, we got creamed corn. And the first sample is the best creamed corn that you ever had. Nice golden color, kernels all very tender, not too sweet, not too creamy. And the second one is brown in color, has a caramel flavor from being heated too high a temperature for too long and so forth. The second sample would normally be we'll say disliked much. But coming after a liked extremely sample, the contrast effect, it would tend to have a lower one. We believe this still exists, although it's very hard to prove it on a large scale because the test is quite subject to variability. The opposite thing has not been shown with even less satisfaction. That is, when you have a, uh, uh, a low quality sample first, something that test three here, for example. And then you have a higher uh, good quality sample, which would normally test seven. In contrast, will it taste eight, will it test eight or nine? That's rather more difficult to, to, uh, to uh, determine. Also, unfortunately, the contrast effect seems to occur with some samples and not with others. For example, the contrast effect does apply to coffee. A good cup of coffee will have a big effect on a poor cup coming after it. It'll taste too poor. But with milk or orange juice, it didn't seem to have very much effect. So the contrast effect varies between different items of food. I've been thinking about that a little bit, uh, and trying to explain it in my own mind. Uh, I think that's because people are more finicky about coffee. They'll drink almost any kind of milk. You know, milk is good for everybody, so forth. And so uh, there isn't any such thing as bad milk. Uh, everybody drinks milk, they don't think about it. It doesn't have any quality aspects. But everybody in their right minds knows there are different qualities of coffee. And they, they get to be more, more critical about it. So I would ex not expect milk to show much effect to this, but because people don't recognize different qualities of milk. But I would expect them to do it. Orange juice, that surprised me. I can't quite understand why orange juice, because Good Lord, the difference between canned, reconstituted, powdered orange juice and really fresh orange juice is the difference between day and night. Much different than bad coffee and good coffee. But anyway, in this particular test, it didn't show up. Now, contamination effects uh, are effects where the rating moves in the direction of the quality of all the samples. If you're tasting a large number of samples and uh, 
they're all about the same general quality, and then you bring in one sample that is not quite the same, it's contaminated with all these surrounding preceding uh, quality uh, ratings in a certain area, and that contaminates the effect on this one here. It tends to move in that direction. You have four very wonderful samples of coffee, and then you have a coffee that's not is a little bit different than that one, a little bit less. They'll, you'll tend to repeat yourself on that. That's a tendency of habitu an error of habituation, I believe. But at least you tend to move in that direction. And it's given, given a specific name in hedonic scorecards as contamination. And then, of course, the position effects uh, are present, uh, as always, the time order error, uh, particularly where there's adaptation, first sample effect. It's also been shown in, a, in another way that you may get some uh, contamination effects if you give them a series of very low quality samples. The contamination effect is where all the samples are poor. You've got nothing but bad coffee, one time after the other, day after day. The army coffee is awful. And uh, then suddenly you get a coffee that is a, is a little better. And, uh, well, anyway, I didn't say that quite right. If you're giving them a series of very low quality samples, about the third or fourth time you do that, the score will perceptibly improve. You become contaminated. Your, your scale of values changes. You, you, you say to yourself intuitively, well, gee, if, that's, if all the coffees are like that, maybe I'm being too critical. Maybe I'm being too critical. So after a series of low quality samples, there will be an imperceptible change to say that the next sample is better than it really is. Maybe out of the same dirty coffee pot as the other samples, but you'll feel it's a little bit better. Well, now, some of the good things about the hedonic scorecard. It's simple, very simple to give, easy for people to understand. It requires, as I said, a minimum of verbal communication or verbal ability. They only have to check. They don't have to remember very many words and there are words that are very easy to understand. The responses are believed to be meaningful, with some exceptions, people who are trying out Foxha and things like that, but generally people will give you a meaningful response. The results can be handled by the usual statistics of scores, means, standard deviations, standard error of the means, um, analysis of variance, and so forth. Uh, it, it truly indicates a preference if they say they like this one extremely and they say they dislike this one much, that is a, a meaningful and it does indicate a preference. And it can be used for new products and this is one of its best uses. Suppose that you are developing new kinds of, of uh, jello and you want to try them and one of the samples comes through as always being liked extremely, whereas the normal, the others all come out being liked slightly. Well, then you're in clover. You, Report that to your boss and ask for a vacation and a bonus right away quickly if you get that kind of a result. However, there, uh, the, 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 we have to uh, say some other things about it too. The variability is rather high from time to time. And so it cannot be used for quality control. Or it can't be used for measuring the degree of change with time, as in a storage experiment, for example. Uh, it takes, the variability is so great, it takes too large a number of judges to get a meaningful or measurable difference. Also, you have to control, if the differences are small, you have to control the judges and the test conditions the best you can. Now, that's not true when you have these big mess hall things and you have hundreds of people answering, thousands in some cases. But in other cases where you're looking for small differences, the, the variability of the judges and the variability in the test condition just rules it out for quality control and also for changes over time. Now, there are other kinds of, of, um, of these uh, kind of things. For people who can't read, children, for example, you, uh, I can't draw very well, but uh,
for that kind of thing. This is called a smiley hedonic scorecard. They do them much better, of course, in print. But uh, th these, these were, do not occur here at all. You simply have a, a series of charts of different degrees of smiley. And children will use this without uh, very much uh, difficulty. Um, and uh, and they're um, quite useful. Um, this has been used for orange juice for children. It's been used for ice cream for children and so forth. And the, one of the first words that children use is, how do you like? So you say, how do you like? And you point to one of these. And the child nods, this one here. Then you give them another sample, and, how do you like it? And they point to this one. So after two or two and a half years of age, you can be doing hedonic scorecards on children. What's another kind of scorecard to use on children, though? It's even better than that. No communication necessary at all. When you give them four samples of ice cream, and you see which one they eat first, and you see how much of which one they eat first, or how much of the total do they eat. And that immediately is a, is a hedonic scorecard. They've expressed pleasure and displeasure in that. Yes, ma'am? Do they automatically taste all four first? Yes, they usually will. Children will go back and forth. They're just like chickens. <laughs> exactly like chickens. Chickens do the same thing. They'll go along, and if, they, if it's new kinds of food, then they'll pick, out, pick at the one they are like the best and eat it up first. Okay, what else can I say? Oh, yes. Now, if you have... Uh, two different experiments uh, under, let's say you, you have one hedonic scorecard for apple pie with this class right here. And we're going to test apple pie right off the class. I wish we could. I should have thought of that. Um, and you would give, we would mark a hedonic scorecard. The next test that was given to a class would be on Thursday. Not this class, but another class right after the examination. And you'd give them a hedonic scorecard for the same apple pie. This class, we'll say, would come up with an average score after this class today would, would be, uh, let's say, seven. The other class, same kind of students here, under different circumstances, when they were peeved at the kind of examination they get, I hope you won't be, and so forth, uh, they would come up with probably four as the average score. So you cannot compare average scores for hedonic scorecards get gotten under different circumstances and with different panels unless you know that the circumstances are the same and the panels are the same. The variability will be too great and you will get what is apparently significant differences when in fact the apple pies were exactly the same. There are too many other things that influence the quality evaluation. Temperature of the room, uh, external uh, smells, condition of the market that morning, political situation, uh, all kinds of things. Okay, now the last part of this, I want to talk about another kind of a test. Oh, wait a minute, I got some more. On page 373, there's a very useful chart, and one that I wished I had devised, because these people are going to go down in history as having devised something that lasted. They were interested at the quartermaster, and we're all interested, restaurant people particularly are interested, what should we serve with uh, one food and another? So the question was, how well do French fries go with, and then they had two, two different products here, green, peas, and sauerkraut. And they had an endotic scorecard. Extremely well, very well, moderately well, slightly well, slightly poor, very poor, extremely poor, and they gave them a chance to say, cannot decide. Some people just wouldn't know. They like them both, green peas and sauerkraut. Now, this gave very good, useful information to a menu planner. 
How well do French fries go with green peas? Well, the average score may come out here to be very well, and you could number these and find out. Whereas with sauerkraut, it might be someplace over here. Uh, and so that under normal conditions, you might then decide if you were uh, determining menus for a million and a half people that you would not normally serve French fries with sauerkraut. They did this for quite a number of foods, and it was quite satisfactory. Uh, it's very interesting to to know that in this particular test, their hedonic ratings of green peas and of sauerkrauts was quite independent of their liking of how well they go after French fried potatoes. So you cannot find this combination, French fried potatoes and peas, from how well people like peas. Uh, and particularly sauerkraut. There were a lot more people who like sauerkraut than there were people who like sauerkraut after French fries. And you can understand that. Sauerkraut makes French fries get soggy and so forth. It's juicy and so forth. Whereas peas don't. The French fries will stay crisper longer after green peas than they will after sauerkraut. Well, that's my explanation. I don't know that that's a true statement or not. Now, uh, one of the things you can build into hedonic scorecards to make them more meaningful if you, if you need to make small differences, suppose you're in product development and you want to find rather small differences. It may make quite a bit of difference whether you're using half butter and half margarine as against just butter in making a new kind of cookie. Well, one of the things to do is to give them a triangular test first to find out if they can find any difference. Give them a triangular test first to find any difference. Then if they can find a difference, the hedonic ratings will be more reliable. It's, it's all, there's two reasons for this. One, they've got a training in this. And second, they have the confidence that there is a difference. So they will be more meaningful in finding out why there's a difference, and they'll be more reliable. The results will come out better. So by preceding hedonic, certain kinds of hedonic scorecards with the triangular taste test, the panel reacts better to the hedonic score. Now, the dilution tests are sort of a form of extinction, extinction techniques or extinction methods. It's a sort of a form of a threshold test, as we've already seen what threshold tests are. It's uh, been used to, to study the degree of off odors in water or the degree of off odors in quite a number of different products, whether they're present or not. Or it's been used to study the, how much you had to change a basic taste to um, not have it recognized. It's been studied for non-neutral additives that have flavors. For example, the, the flavor of uh, the bitter flavor of um, sodium. Um, sugar substitute that's going to disappear this fall. Not psychomates. Um, saccharin. There was an article in Science yesterday. You could kiss your saccharin goodbye because health and education and welfare is going to ban it this fall. So if you need uh, the, the substance, now is the time to buy your <laughs> saccharin. So in, in yesterday's, uh, in Monday's uh, Science Magazine, it's also used to get an estimate of the uh, highest acceptable con concentration that will be passable of a su substance. You may not want to blend it out completely, but you want to find out at what level it will still be acceptable. That's what we call in quality control the minimum level for acceptance. How little will people take? Now it's been, it can be used in various ways. The one that's uh, been used a lot is the dilution technique of milk, or dilution number of milk, the DN of milk. Um, in this case, for example, it was used in the early days when dried milk first came in uh, as to how bad the dried milk was. And the, the test was made as to how much uh, uh, fresh milk you had to 
put in the reconstituted dried milk so that it could not be found any different from, from whole milk or standard whole milk. The test is a little difficult to, to give because in some cases whole milk of the same quality is not available day in and day out. But you can give the test to a large number of people over a single day in, in that particular uh, case. Um, so you are now taking a milk sample, standard milk sample. In a, this was done in a duo trio test. And you are testing it against uh, reconstituted milk where the uh, percent reconstituted milk was zero. So that's the original one, 15, 25, 20, 25, and 30. Um, and these are the percent correct answers. And the percent, or the number of correct responses, excuse me. Now they did the test 20 times. And of course, when it was uh, the um, so that uh, when there when there is um, uh, as the Whole milk is being compared with itself. You don't get very many correct responses because they can't tell it apart. When it only has 15%, this is the percent dried milk. You get more correct responses. When you get up to 30% uh, percent dried milk, anybody can tell them apart from whole milk. And so you get 20 out of 20 correct responses. So you have then here a line relating percent of dried milk to correct responses or ability to de determine dried milk from them. And now they decided uh, ahead of time that they would pass it for human consumption if it, if it got by three-fourths of the time. So they took a line over here with 15. This is not what the book shows. I'll put it where the book does show it. From. It turns out that with 18% dried milk, three-fourths of the people could tell it apart. Three-fourths of the people could tell it apart. And at that stage, they would let it go by. It wasn't very critical, in my opinion, but at least that was the best they could do uh, under these circumstances. The it turned out to be 18.3, I think, in this particular case. Now, there are other ways of doing this, but in all of them have the same thing in common. It's how much of a standard product do you put into uh, one that has an off odor or an off taste in order to uh, make it no different from the standard. And that's what you're generally doing. You use regular binomial procedures. Duo trio, you could use paired testing, you could use triangular testing to find them apart. And you set up some sort of standard as to what you are going to demand in this, because in some cases you can actually change this in plant thing. In reconstituted milk, for example, this could be controlled. You have a certain amount of fresh milk, and you could put this dried milk in it, and uh, and that would uh, indicate, um, uh, and you could do that uh, under plant conditions. You don't have enough uh, whole fresh whole milk, but you have some, and you can cut down the amount of the off odor of dried milk by that method. Well, some other things that's been used in, how much margarine can there be in butter before they can tell the difference? I think that's a treasonous kind of experiment to do, <laughs> but they've done that. Uh, it's also been used to detect how much beef flavor there is in, um, in different ways of preparing beef. They extracted the flavor with water and then determined how much uh, water to dilute out the beef character. The, co the water was colored, so it was the same as the beef color. And this gave them a measure then of the strength of the beef 
extract from beef by how much water they had to put in it till they could not tell it was any different from water itself. These um, tests are, um, have one big deficiency. And the, the deficiency is based on the effect of dilution that it has some sort of straight line relationship with quality. It's been, these have been used for quality tests. That milk one is a sort of a quality test. And um, that's not a verifiable assumption. In fact, it's quite unlikely that the dilution will have any straight line relationship with uh, the quality or that the effect of the dilution will be absolutely linear irrespective of the quality. Uh, and you know that from the lecture we had on olfaction. What happens to odors when you change the concentration of odors? The nature of the odor itself changes. Diacetyl at very low concentrations has a buttery smell. If you smell pure diacetyl, you wouldn't even think of butter. So when you start diluting, you change the nature of the odor. And even with taste, when you get down near the threshold, the tastes have equivocal flavors. Salt doesn't taste exactly salty. Well, better sugar begins to taste a little bitter sometime at the, the lower concentration. You're not sure it's sweeter or bitter. And sour changes at the low concentration. You sometimes confuse it with, with uh, saltiness. So this assumption that this is a straight line relationship is not provable and is probably not true and that therefore all the dilutions tests suffer from this assumption. However, they've been very useful for things that cannot be otherwise easily measured. Uh, for example, Dr. Dunkley and uh, Ms. Pangborn got interested in that stage. We're very much interested in this problem of oxidation flavor in milk. It's, oxidation flavor occurs certain times of the year when the cows are on certain kind of food and when there's any even remote contact with copper. Very tiny amount. Well, this was a very subtle sort of thing. And dilution tests gave them a measure of oxidized uh, odor that was not easy to get in any other way. Uh, and so under those circumstances, since they got useful information from it, it was a useful kind of, um, of test to do. Now, um, the man that's done the most work on dilution tests as a measure of quality has been Tilner in Poland. The Polish government has a very big problem because they export quite a bit of prepared food, jams and jellies, and particularly ham. Poland is one of the world's largest exporters of ham. Polish ham is very well known in Western Europe and even in fancy grocery stores in this country. So they set up dilution tests to test how much ham flavor there was and how much other kinds of flavor there was in the ham. And they made this government policy. That's one of the advantages of it socialist country or a dictator country. All he had to do was press a button and every single ham that was turned out of um, Poland had to go through a dilution test to see what the uh, dilutability was. And unless it had a certain amount of ham flavor and so forth and other characteristics, it couldn't be exported. And they actually graded hams on the basis of this particular dilution test. There's a table in here that I want to talk about. Just a moment. It says Gridgman's table, but I don't find Gridgman's table. Well, um, he used it not only with uh, hams, but he used it with spices. They, uh, they had to, uh, for importing spices, they have to come up to a standard that they dilute out too quickly. They don't have enough spice character. They used it for tomato concentrate. If the tomato concentrate uh, mixed with fresh tomato juice, it took too much fresh tomato juice to dilute out the concentrate flavor.